<clears throat> All right, so this is the pre-class video for the class on July 6th, Wednesday. And the main subject is going to be four articles from the book called Einstein's God. And this was um, this was required for you to buy. So I hope you bought it. Um, there's a couple other books that were required coming up soon. Um, one of them is The World Religions, Houston Smith. And one of them is The Justice That Men Owe Women. And that's uh, by Robert Raines. <clears throat> so I hope you've ordered them. Um, if not, I am going to uh, let you cheat <laughs> this time, and I'm going to put all four articles uh, as attachments because I taught this class in Southeast Asia and they don't, they couldn't order the book. So I did scan them all, but it's really against the law to do this. So I hope you buy the book. I mean, I expect that you buy the book because uh, we do have some more readings in it. All right, so we didn't finish up last time. Uh, we're getting behind, um, but uh, all I want you to do is just do as much as you can. I'm, I am going to assign the things that I normally assign. And uh, if you do all of them, I think you're pretty much, uh, you know, you'll get an A, I think. So it's just a matter of how much you can do and the quality of what you do and, thing, and things like that. Um, so I hope it all works out. I appreciate when you come prepared and even if you aren't prepared, you can respond to what the other students say especially in the topics for today. So as long as the idea is that we've come together to talk about a lot of serious questions, a lot of questions that you think about. So you don't necessarily have to read um, in order to at least know that this is controversial. Now the, the problem is that in a sense, you can't have an informed decision or opinion unless you read and read quite a bit. But the class is definitely on the side of you read one article and you sort of reflect on it. And then to me, you just put it on a shelf somewhere and realize, okay, that's one other aspect of human life that people think about, they experience, and they have different ideas about how to resolve it. And it's one more aspect of the complexity of, of human life, but also, I mean, the infinite curiosity you can have, the many ways you can help people understand yourself. So they're all what Plato called serious questions. All right, so I'm gonna start out with something we didn't finish last time, and that is, um, we did talk about Aristotle's virtues, and uh, I went through it in class and also in the pre-class video. But um, the thing I want to go through again, I did in the pre-class video, but we didn't do a class. So we'll start the class talking about the relationship between Jesus and Socrates. and whether the comparing them and the various Aristotelian virtues. The, what I wanna emphasize is that in the ancient traditions, the conversion experience to convert means to literally to turn around. And so there's a turning around from looking at the world simply through your senses through habit, through imitation. That's what a child, how a child learns to live. And also 
as an adult, if you just look at the world like a Gallup poll, if you just look at what it appears to be, it appears to be that people care about pleasure, wealth, power, and glory. But if you turn around, the philosophical conversion is that by nature, we seek justice and virtue, and we have empathy, and we want to get along with each other. And that's what's natural. And so um, Socrates appeared to be the bad guy, and he was the good guy. And that's where it gets very ambiguous. Was Euthyphro a good guy or a bad guy? What really motivated him? What kind of character did he have? Same with Miletus. So the Beatitudes, Jesus um, has a very analogous move. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So that's the idea that in this world, uh, we judge, we live one way, but the truth is the opposite. Now, the emphasis here is what I want you to juxtapose, is to what extent does being a Christian mean that you just reject this world as sinful or whatever, and you focus on eternal life. If I just believe in God, if I just pray to Jesus, if I just have a pure heart, I'll go to heaven and I, and I don't need to pay attention to what's going on in the world, right? That's one kind of Christianity. It's one kind of religion is that you don't bring in your reason to try and fix things in the world. And another kind of union of reason and faith is that God wants us to use science and social science, humanities, everything we can with our minds to try and create a world that's more like the real world, which is where good, good people are rewarded, bad people are punished, and people pursue virtue and justice. So on the one hand, there's this seeing, have an eye of the soul that sees things differently, that sees that by nature we seek justice and wisdom. Now the Greeks, the Greek influence in Western culture was definitely to go on the side of humanism, Christian humanism, and to integrate all your rational capacities with your faith. So faith means making the world a better place. And that's why our founders wanted citizens to be able to solve problems at town hall meetings and solve their own problems, govern themselves. That came from the Greek. And then also people came to the US because they belonged to different Christian denominations or sects that were persecuted in England. And so they were committed to their religious communities also. Now, some of those communities were anti-intellectual and that's where you had to cultivate your reason as a citizen over here and your religion over there. That's where you keep them separate. If your religion rejects reason, it's okay at church, but it's not okay when you're acting as a citizen. But they did, our founders were mostly Episcopalians, 85 uh, of them were Episcopalian. One was Baptist and there were some Unitarians, et cetera. But the vast majority united reason and faith and they very much wanted you. They're, they changed their faith to conform to reason. And so they did believe there was a God over and above what our reasoning can produce, but definitely you're supposed to use your reason to be motivated by your faith, to fix the world, to rule and be ruled, 
and to make the world a better place. So, so that's number one is Jesus teaches you to see things differently. Um, he uses a lot of poetry. Um, he talks about the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Um, the Greeks also had this view of the light of the mind. Um, and I, I, can, I do think all of my students have a mind and the class is trying to ignite their mind, get them to realize that somewhere in the back of your mind, you think about serious questions all the time and just bringing that into the light and conversing with other people is what the class is about, but it's what, what, it's what friendships are about. It's why friendships are important. Um, all right. Then the next issue is, if you remember, Euthyphro was a, a literalist. He quoted from Homer, and he said, well, this is just the way it is. And um, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the rabbis, Jesus was born a Jew, the rabbis quoted from the Torah and the Tal Talmud, and they had a lot of rules and regulations. And Jesus um, came along and he said, well, the real essence of the Torah and the Talmud is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it, that this is what it was really about. Um, um, all right, then he questions the righteousness of the, of the religious leaders, like Socrates. He questioned the religious leaders. He wanted to hold them accountable. Um, then he goes through the some of the Ten Commandments, and he says it, it's more than that. Like virtue is more than just following rules. Um, you shouldn't even be angry with your brother, with your fellow human being. You should make peace with the people around you before you go to worship at a, a service. Um, then adultery, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So this is about purity of heart. And you should think about it, right? I mean, you know what he's talking about. The question is, do Americans have a reputation for really following the Sermon on the Mount. When other, and this is a problem with media also. When other people uh, read about what's going on in America, do they really think Americans are really Christian? Um, do they have evidence? So a lot of my students really are. And so I'm not saying we're not, it's just, how do we appear? How are we really? Is this, is this the direction our country is going in? Is it a direction we want to go in? Um, and my point as a philosophy teacher is just to compare how many of the major religions have a, the, a lot of the same basic virtues so that Religion should never be able to be used as a weapon where people use their religion to be self-righteous and to think that they're better than somebody else. And also the basic principles of secular humanism also have the same virtues. So it's very ironic when people can be better than somebody else because of their brand, their label. Um, I'm a I'm a humanist. I'm not a Christian. Or I'm a Christian. I'm not a humanist. None of that really makes sense. Even though I will give you quotes from 
uh, people who do separate themselves based on supposedly this ideology. So it's a set of ideas rather than a way of life and a set of virtues. Um, what he says about divorce, do Americans follow that? Um, okay. Okay, let's see. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Don't resist an evil person. So <clears throat> there's a whole scholarship behind this, but is capital punishment consistent with Christianity? And there are many Christians who think, no, it's not. And this is a quote that they use. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is different than the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is reforming it or replacing it, or definitely he's got a different kind of ethos. And he demands something higher, the, the purity of heart. So some churches will quote more from the Old Testament than from the New Testament. And, and some quote from Paul rather than Jesus. I mean, you could, you could take the Bible and kind of use it however you want, just like Euthyphro did. Um, love your enemies. Is that the way Americans act? Um, does it mean... I mean, I always feel like my students at Lion come and they they do want virtue. And it's amazing they've managed to survive this far without getting, well, still with really good intentions. And then the question is, how do you function in this world? Um, give to the needy. Um, pray. There's the Lord's Prayer. Fasting, don't fast in public, do it in secret. So another issue is that Jesus wanted people to fill, to live out their faith privately. They're not supposed to make a big deal out of it. Uh, so we just don't know. When we look at people, we don't know what goes on inside of them. If they're living the faith, if they're not, if they're living the virtues and we all change over time so there isn't any one answer set in stone about these issues do americans not worry about economic success and jesus says you know don't worry about it um god will provide now is that a virtue not to worry about it? <laughs> In our society, is it a virtue not to worry about it? What happens if people don't worry about money? How is it that even coming to college, it costs money, people get into debt? So I don't think there's a simple answer to that. But again, you go to the Sermon on the Mount and um, the standard is pretty high. Don't judge others. Is that the way we act? Um, when you, why do you judge another person rather than check out your own vices? Um, yeah, first worry about your own vices and then you can uh, deal with somebody else. So I don't, I, my own experience is that I've done that myself. But I do think uh, it's very easy to get to make that mistake. But you can, all of these virtues are virtues of a humanist. I've had a lot of students who are self described atheist humanist, secular humanist, but they make all sorts of efforts to be virtuous in this sense. Um, seek and you will find. Well, the question there is, what is it that you're seeking? And I think Socrates is just seeking self-knowledge. He's trying to find somebody who knows more than he does about something so he can be a good citizen and a better, a more informed citizen. So it really depends upon what you're seeking. If you're seeking wealth or something, you're trying to make a business deal with God, 
like Euthyphro toward a, at the end, you scratch my, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back, that somehow what you get in return is a good family or a stable society. Um, it doesn't work that way, right? You just seek to be a better person. Um, let's see, true prophets and false prophets, that's a big issue that in our polarized world, we do accuse the people we don't identify with as being false prophets or hypocrites. Whether they call themselves Christians or humanists or whatever they call themselves, we are in this terrible syndrome of um, trying to find out who the real <laughs> virtuous person is and, and just doing too much labeling. Um, let's see. Doing the will of the Father, all right. Does that just mean blind faith and ignoring this world? Or does it mean uh, doing the will of the Father? And that would mean you'd have to do stuff. Building your house on a rock. I mean, I love these images. They're wonderful. Um, uh, poetry. And why is it poetry? Well, because it appeals to your imagination. And um, so this is a quote from St. Paul. There's different gifts, but the same spirit. So in your virtue of rational ambition, when you're finding out what you're really passionate about, you come to college, you get exposed to all sorts of stuff. Um, your teachers, all your teachers could make more money doing something else, but they do this because they're passionate about it. So um, students get exposed to all this stuff. They have to take classes about art or music or theater or uh, social science. And then they, then they figure out what is it that they're passionate about. Um, and for me, of course, it was philosophy. And um, so that's, that's a part of liberal education. Okay, and we will, we will, the different gifts, same spirit, you will see that that works out in Hinduism also has a big uh, part of it is different. People are different. And so spiritually, they're different. Um, and that gets corrupted, just like everything else. Anyway, so the next section we're doing is um, four articles about personal virtues, and the union of reason and faith. So Krista Tippett is created a uh, Minnesota radio, uh, public radio show. And you can go to that online. It's, um, it's www.onbeing.org. And Okay, and um, and there's this is the most recent um, on being listening party celebrating twenty years. Um, but then you can go and search any one of the. There are hundreds and hundreds of these. And you can search for the ones that I've assigned over here. The first one I did was Newland, Biology of the, oops. There it is, the Biology of the Spirit. And Esther Sternberg, that's another one we read for today. But you tell so many okay. wonderful stories in all your writing. You chose to write about your grandmother, your Bubba, in How We Die. Okay, so you can do that. Um, and I, all right. So I just took an outline from that article. I picked out the points that I, I'll 
discuss in class unless each of you has something different to talk about. Um, so Newland's, Newland's story is that he was raised a pretty conservative Orthodox Jewish uh, tradition. And at a certain point, he got very depressed and he rejected his religion. He's a surgeon or a, a medical doctor. And then he realized, he started thinking about the way the human body heals itself and the way it seeks transcendence and it seeks integrity. And then he realized, well, that's pro that is essentially what religion is about anyway. And so he realized that you can unify um, the science of the human body, biology, with religious um, teachings and basically the basic virtues is what I would say. So he has his own version of how to describe the union because obviously everybody grows up exposed to different ideologies, different um, ways of understanding the world. So my cl in my class, I just give you many, many different ones every day and during the summer. So our capacity for beauty and love, our drive to create balance in life and moral order in society. This is an evolutionary accomplishment. Um, and so the brain, all right, the brain has evolved, it's adapted, we've adapted to the world. And what he says, without reading Aristotle, I don't think he knew anything about Aristotle, is that we seek balance. Um, and he wants the ideas uh, can be united with religious perspectives. They don't rule out the idea of a creator, but they don't require an idea of a creator. So this can be strictly humanist, or it can be humanist plus any number of religions. So anything in the class that I teach can be consistent with what Newland is saying. Um, so Newland was raised with too much guilt, and it crippled his ability to function as a human being. Um, okay, and so the, what Newland says is that we evolutionarily, when we are flourishing the most, our personal flourishing and our cultural flourishing are not split apart because our brain is always reacting to what else, what's outside and adapting. So the within and the without need to be constantly balanced out. And, um, and so a culture that encourages those, that kind of integrity, integration of human, individual flourishing and cultural flourishing is really what you want. So you do have an idea of where you, where you wanna go and it should be based on your religion and on your um, citizenship consciousness. Okay, what he thought were his religious beliefs were just obsessional thinking. It had to do with fear. Um, he changed his mind and he began thinking of God as a God of love. So that's what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount is that the Old Testament tends to think of God as a God of fear, which the Jewish tradition emphasizes that doesn't mean <laughs> There's plenty of Jews that are not like that. But, and there's, you know, you know, the, the orthodoxy, the brand is not the same as just trends. People can see beneath the words. Um, so Jesus wanted you to think of God as a God of love. Um, okay, so, so, he thinks if there is a God who created free will, he would have created a free will that makes the synapses and the nerve cells and the neurotransmitters 
and allows them to make choices, right? We always choose the way that's healthy, physically healthy, emotionally healthy, the thing that's going to make it survive. So the way our bodies work and the way we self-consciously are aware of the way our bodies work gives us the free will to choose integrity, to choose uh, balance, and to know that this is physiologically what we should be doing. Um, the doctors simply remove the obstacles to healing and encourage the healing to take place. But the body is the one that's doing the most activity. The doctor just works with your body. And Socrates does talk about two kinds of doctors, the ones that let people make themselves sick and then fix it with all these <laughs> fake therapies and make a lot of money or the ones that just encourage wellness and just sort of remove obstacles. Um, okay, he emphasizes a lot being kind to everyone you meet, um, just letting people speak. Everyone needs to be understood. And again, this class is trying to um, give everyone a voice give everyone a chance to speak. Um, I, I mean, every semester I teach it, it grieves me more because of how polarized we are and how difficult it is to try and stay informed about political life without becoming polarized, which is a, a disease of the soul. I mean, it's not good for you. It appeals to fear a lot. Um, so all I can say is that the class trying to keep remembering what really matters is important. Uh, the relation between science and religion is a conversation. Okay, it's not, it's, for the rest of your life, really, you will be figuring out, well, what's my vision of the good life? And where am I now? And how can I move in that direction? And um, you might, that might be a strictly secular humanist vision, or it might be related to some religion. But there's just this constant uh, to and uh, dialogue, but they are not, they should not be at odds. Because when they're at odds, people really, it's toxic. It's bad for you. And yeah, our political climate has become very toxic psychologically and toxic in terms of what's actually going on, the way people are treating each other. Um, all right, the next article is about revenge and what it is the researcher is, looks at the hard wiring, the way our brains are hardwired for revenge and for forgiveness. And this again goes back to survival drive. Um, and people disagree. Like some people think survival of the fight, uh, fittest is competitive and adversarial, right? And that plays out in our political realm. Like are the best people, um, the business people who have competed and won so if you're a rich business person, is that an indication that you would know a lot about political life? Or is that not what you want? Are the best business people the ones that really cultivate flourishing within their companies, that the companies are philanthropic, they give money away to cultivate virtue in the community and, um, and that's what Michael McCullough is saying, is that we're really wired for um, both cooperation and um, competition. And in the past, we were functioning at a more competitive level, but not now. Um, now, we really, in order to survive and thrive, we really need to adapted to huge social and political systems 
of laws and policies because we depend on each other so much and we're so we're in such a high tech you know high highly intellectual situation that the more you focus intellectually in your way to survive the more you depend on all these other people to do all this other stuff for you um so he starts out with anger is a is a moral response um okay and um but we are cooperative by nature that's his claim is that if we really want to thrive we have to cooperate with people we don't even know right that's a political community we tolerate mistakes we're always forgiving this was when we were talking about um putting up with with uh small injustices um parents continually forgive their children um that's the sociability one um then there's the problem of forgiving you you know creating a tribe where you have us versus them uh crito had his sort of tribe right he's a he's uh expected as a rich guy to help his friends and harm his enemies um all right um so what did socrates do right he he wasn't angry at his accusers just like jesus they weren't angry at their accusers okay the oklahoma bombing um bud welsh's daughter was killed but then he went and met the father of the bomber and he you know there was a picture of him playing baseball on the mantelpiece and he had a lot of empathy with the father it was just a father it was just his kid at one point so he decided the death penalty wasn't going to solve anything killing one more person would not bring his daughter back uh, so that's how he got over his revenge. Um, and Mac uh, Michael McCullough recommends um, that the death penalty doesn't really solve things. Um, and politicians can, of course, appeal to it. But the important thing also is you can't forgive someone in a vacuum. You have to have Mr. Welch could only forgive Tim McVeigh's dad when he knew that Tim McVeigh would never get out of prison, was never going to be a threat again. The system would prosecute the offender. Tim McVeigh would be prosecuted, would be in prison for life. He would be safe. And um, that's why it's important to prevent um, school shootings to prevent all the violence that we see around us. We have to have a system that we can trust. And of course, that's a huge problem with Black Lives Matter and the relationship between police officers and especially Black males is because the system isn't working. Um, all right. so. School shootings are 60% are caused by bullying. So people feel threatened, right? They haven't been protected by families, by schools. Um, let's see. All right. Then there's a section, or I brought in a section from what some of the really most toxic environments for trying to get over the revenge reaction response is Israel and Palestine, it's a horrible situation, and Uganda, where children were kidnapped and brainwashed and then they killed their own family members, right? How do you get over that? Well, um, what the research my student did just said that restorative justice, the people who are the most willing to get over it are the mothers of small children 
because they don't want their children to suffer and they're tired of revenge. No matter how bad it was, um, they're tired of it. So South Africa had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, so there's ways that people try to overcome the revenge response, but you can't overcome it unless you set up a society where people can trust that the people who harmed them will be, will not harm again. Um, so, we need to learn to forgive to survive. And the Sermon on the Mount, you know, emphasizes that. Let's see. All right. So that's the second one. Um, the third article is depression. So how do we talk about depression? So there's different ways. There's the, the psychology, the brain psychology, the psychology, just your, your relationships, your emotions. The medical situation, your brain, your brain chemistry, and then the spiritual situation, which is your idea of some higher good, something you want to live for, something you're moving toward. Um, and you feel cut off from God or the universe or anything you value. Um, let's see. The nature of the human soul is to be, is this passion for life. Um, and that motivates what we do. So you have to combine drugs, therapies, and external experiences. So the point there is that you aren't going to be able to cure someone if they go right back into the same social situation that caused the problem in the first place. They're going to, you're going to have to repair people's relationships and you're going to have to repair their uh, inner thoughts. And drugs can provide a way to sort of break through the, the brain chemistry that they're in at that time. But ultimately, they need to reform it so that they themselves can produce the kind of brain chemistry that will motivate them to be able to function in the world. Um, the, okay. Then they noticed that Aristotle uh, didn't detach the body from the mind, but also that Augustine did. And he labeled depression as a disease of the soul. It's because you're a sinner. Um, and if you get depressed, it's your fault and you're guilty. And um, the Newland's Jewish upbringing gave him this huge amount of guilt and it was made him depressed. Um, Parker Palmer, Anita Barrows, she turned to Buddhism and she talked about her mother. But in the end of the day, depression can lead to uh, spiritual insight. So Krista Tippett, in that interview, she points out that she went through depression in her life too. And she's interviewing all these people about their spiritual lives, but she herself had a bout with depression. Um, so what can you discuss? The relation between science and religion in these articles. Um, and then the third one, or fourth one, is stress. What about stress? My students know about stress. And that's why I, I feel bad about assigning all the stuff I assign. And I really don't want you to get stressed out about it. So... I want you to be as proactive as you can, to do as much as you can, um, and let it go. I will, the, the issue there is usually I, students don't have to hand things in until a day or two before the grades are due. The trouble is in the summer session, the grades are due like uh, two days after the last day of class. 
So I just hope that you can manage to juggle what you need to juggle. Also, you can meet with me for office hours if you need any help, um, but try not. I don't want my class to be part of the problem. <laughs> I want it to be just giving you a chance to think about these issues. Now, Esther Sternberg was raised to focus only on the scientific uh, way of looking at the world, scientific assumption, which is emotions are separated from your physical health. I don't think, I think a, a vast majority or a lot of doctors and people have realized that you can't separate emotions from physical health. Um, so again, there's all these biochemical connections in your brain. There is a positive person, a, a purpose to the human stress response, which is to protect us from danger. This is like the revenge response. It has a positive purpose, but ultimately it's not the way to, for people to flourish or for societies to flourish. Um, but the stress re response is a way to protect us from danger. It's just that when we feel danger all the time, then the, it gets, it starts becoming a feedback loop and it's over stimulated or suppressed and it doesn't function anymore. Um, people get sick. Um, we, the ancients were more intuitive about this connection and science tried to break the connection and just fix you with drugs or, um, you know, physical material interventions without also including your ideas, your thoughts, your hopes, your fears. Um, okay. So she started doing some uh, research and then she ended up going to Crete. And uh, this again is interesting because it's the Greek stuff all over again. I didn't pay her to do this, to write this article, but this is what it's about. She went to the temple of Asclepius. The, he's the son of Apollo. Apollo is the god of reason. He has a son who is the god of healing. And, and she started to heal. Her body started to get better. Her background was also strict Jewish, and um, she gradually learned how to make that more humanistic. Um, she talks about Descartes, and she had an argument with her mother about the difference between science and ideas. She did brain research. The hippocampus is the part that triggers fear if you take, you know, um, brain psychology. You learn about all the parts of the brain. Um, okay. Stressful circus. She was under stressful circumstances and it kicked in for her. So we need to become more self-aware. Give yourself permission to take care of yourself so you don't mess up your stress response. Um, Greek, Greek um, mythology symbolizes the relationship between the mind and the body, and I talked about that. Um, uh, in addition to the antidepressant drugs, you need um, talk therapy, right? You need um, someone to talk to. You need to become conscious of what you need to do to heal. And then meditation, they're discovering, Western scientists are discovering that some of these meditation techniques that the Hindus and the Buddhists have actually are good for you. They change how your immune system works. Um, okay, so once again, we have the relation between science and religion, the relationship between your childhood and your coming of age. And, your, and the relationship between your social situation 
and your ability to have integrity. All right. So um, I have a, a whole list of the causes of unjust suffering. So human beings suffer unjustly. And then we ask why, right? So, I mean, it's for some, you know, at one extreme, it would be somehow it's God's will for us to suffer and it's a testing our faith. But, you know, in this class, when you unite reason and faith, you can look at all the different causes. Some of them are physical. We're just, um, we have bodies and we get sick. Some of that sickness is due to our own um, just luck, bad luck. Some of it is your bad habits, right? Um, so we have to think about that. What, what about your diseases and how to, uh, what was the cause? What can you do about it? And how can you deal with it in a way that will enable you to flourish? What about... Um, the world that you're growing up in, the pollution, the um, all the different ways that chemicals affect what we eat, what we breathe, what we drink, um, is that having an effect on our physical body? And I think it is. Um, my son had neuroendocrine cancer and it's, there's a disruption in his endocrine system. And we scientists know that plastic has endocrine disruptors in it that leach into our food and everything is wrapped in plastic. But that our economy is so dependent on it that there's no way that the EPA can regulate it. It can't say nothing, no food should be wrapped in plastic. <laughs> But that's something you inherit and you have to deal with, but you should be aware of it, that's all. Um, it was choices made by people before you were born or before you had a chance, kind of came of age, but also it's just when you do take over um, and start exercising power, there's a real limit to how much you can uh, change the way that we become dependent on things that are foods, food wrapping, all sorts of stuff that is not good for our bodies. Um, there are accidents in life that is not God's will, right? It's not God's will that your kid got hit by a drunk driver. So what do you do about it? Or that your kid got shot by a mass shooter, right? Um, I think the healthiest way is to work toward reform. I think gun reform, that's a, a way to try and make the world a little bit better for um, other people's children, okay? And there's a lot of issues about what sorts of reform, but 80, 85% of Americans agree with some basic reforms. I think they're going through the Congress right now. Um, certainly, well, I mean, the issue is that when you're, if your child gets shot, do, are you just depressed the rest of your life? Or can you find a way to do something positive in the memory of that child? Um, there's natural disasters. Um, some of those is just Volcanoes exist. We know where they exist. And sometimes people happen to live where there is one. Some places like San Francisco, everybody knows there's going to be a big uh, earthquake. I was there in San Diego and I went to a museum and said, well, sometime in the next 60 years, there will be, I think, uh, on the Richter scale, a nine point earthquake. And I'm, like, I'm standing there thinking, what are we doing here? But we'll see. It's just that when it happens or if it happens, some people will say it's God's will. And other people will say, we knew this. We knew this was coming. Um, 
and you you have to decide well i'm going to live here anyway for whatever reasons but um i don't think you should blame god uh environmental disasters climate change climate disruptions we know this the scientists have known this and it will get attributed to god's will it will get attributed to, i know my students in asia the students i had who were in college there were people in some of those countries who said one of the reasons they're having these climate disasters is because uh, the society turned away from God, and that included educating women and letting them go away from home to college. So all those liberals and those feminists are the reason why we have climate disruption, because God is punishing us. So I do think you need to know that some people think like that. And so their solution is even more conservative religion. And this is true uh, all around the world and with many different religions. So that's important to know. Um, let's see. Um, all right. So anti-intellectual ways to deal with understanding natural disasters is not helpful and we don't do anything to prevent them. Well, then there's psychological suffering. How does that happen? Um, our goal of life is stability of mind. We can know this is how we were meant to live. Um, so um, if you're not, okay, so if you don't pursue self-knowledge, um, the cause of the suffering can be lack of purity of heart, uh, impulsiveness. Um, and it also can be people who go over and beyond what they need to do to just survive, and they run into obstacles. Like you can volunteer for things. You can join the school board or a park board or... Um, all sorts of other volunteer activities, and you might have some suffering, right? You might have conflicts, but that's because you chose it. You wanted to take on something to make the world a better place. So that's different than your own self-indulgence or impulsivity or uh, violence, excessive aggression. And then the other kind of psychological suffering is interpersonal. It's caused because we depend on other people. We love other people, right? Parents love their children, children love their parents because children love them because they depend on them and they need them. And so uh, all too often we, we respect people, we love them because we need them. They're, modeling for us how to live but they make mistakes and then that causes suffering um, um, but the issue here is is the world a better place because we are vulnerable and we do love each other or would be we'd be better off just like machines without emotions <laughs> when we're unable or unwilling to love then we suffer. Um, relationship breakdowns can lead to pain, violence, and despair. Um, but the desire to escape suffering just creates more suffering. So this is an argument for why the world is perfect, even though there's so much suffering and unjust suffering. Now, this section is about the suffering caused by injustices. And children can grow up crippled by racism, sexism, poverty, abusive parents, diseases, or oppression. Um, they can grow up crippled by excess wealth, unjust advantages, overblown egos. And then they think God, had, this is God's will. That's a very corrupt influence. Um, let's see. They think, I mean, they can think anything. They can, if, if they grow up seeing that their parents love them and provide for them, and they see that other kids aren't provided for, 
they might think that, well, then their parents don't love them. And so that is not true, of course. And you have to break through all these appearances that some parents just don't have the opportunities to provide as well for their children. Um, that's why if you let Unite Your Reason, you need to do something so that everyone can have a decent middle-class life and not be stressed out about money all the time. Um, they're crippled by situations they can't control. If it's hatred or fear because of race, uh, sex, ethnicity, social norms that favor one group over another causes incredible unjust suffering. Laws that institutionalize unjust advantages the corruption of the legislative process when the rich provide the money for the political campaigns and then the politicians do whatever they want to to please their donors and the donors just want to get richer so then the whole political system is at the service of the rich and that causes so much unjust suffering um the corruption of the judiciary um, the corruption of law enforcement. Um, how can we distinguish between suffering caused by the human condition, um, just the way things are structured, and suffering caused by ignorance, cynicism, abuses of power? What should we do in the way we live as uh, engaged citizens to accept the necessary suffering to prevent the unnecessary suffering and to change our societies. So we leave behind a world where there's less unjust and unnecessary suffering. And this is, this is again, a huge question. No one answer. You're going out into the world. You're trying, you know, in this class, my goal is, you, you know, you get this huge picture <laughs> of the world that you're going to go out into and then you get some tools for how to cope with it uh, some advice about watch out for this or that or uh, you might take a hit at some point um, and then i had one other thing which i i mentioned in the oh yeah no i i mentioned that so Oh, this is the one where Socrates is compared to Jesus. So, and you can reflect on this in terms of the articles in the Einstein's God. So temperance, um, eating, drinking, not too much, too, not too little sex. To what extent does um, sexual assault, sexual aggression, sexual um, infidelity in a marriage, how much does that lead to depression, stress, um, a physiological response, right? So, and then that affects the society. People can't function as well as citizens. So that's why I think um, I do, I do uh, believe in or think that the institution of marriage is important, gets important for people to make sexual commitments and build a history with other people, because then you have a life history with a person and you can, you learn a lot about yourself. The trouble is, so if a marriage is good and people really do encourage each other and um, become stronger people because they admire the person they're married to and they're, and they, talk to each other like friends. That's the ideal. The trouble is if it goes south, if something happens where your relationship to your partner is distorting reality, somebody thinks they're always right and the other person thinks they're always wrong is an impossible situation. And then I think you need to get out of it. Um, but anyway, the, I also think that if you're non-binary, if you have a different sexual orientation, that that doesn't mean anything about your ability to have a high quality relationship. So in terms of the emotional and uh, all the other aspects of it, 
There's nothing by nature perverted about non-binary sexuality. Um, and that's what we're discovering. But that, again, is a huge controversy. But, um, but as, a, as a citizen, in other words, at church, you can think what you like. But in terms of giving people the right to marriage, the right to all their, all their rights as a citizen, the Supreme Court decided that, yeah, there's nothing about same-sex marriage that it would make the society better rather than worse because then you tie sexual orientation to this desire to make a lifelong commitment, which makes the society more stable. Um, both Jesus and Socrates stood up to authority figures. They questioned them, they exposed their hypocrisy. Um, Jesus, it was religious authorities. Um, both of them were very generous. They didn't overreact with anger. They knew that what they did was honorable, but they didn't seek honor. They were ambitious. They spoke directly to powerful people, even though they were not powerful, uh, not in the class, upper class. They called out, um, both of them said, stop blaming other people. This again is where a political situation is so toxic. It's just agonizing. Um, both had friends, both were sociable, um, both tried to bring out a spiritual renewal. Um, both knew themselves. Both got caught up in political issues. It should have been more about uh, spiritual, about your quality of life, about virtue. But it got caught up with politics. And that is happening now. A lot of very good, well-intentioned people are getting caught up in political uh, polarization. Um, okay, the original system wasn't bad. It was the way it was applied by the jury or the masses um, in Jesus' case. Let's see. The criminal justice system was corrupted. The punishments were excessive, obviously, getting crucified or getting hemlock. It was applied wrongly in the case. What would our founders think? And so this is, again, what I emphasize, that the books I'm teaching are part of what's called the great conversation, right? So you're in on the ideas that the founders wanted college students to get in on to, to learn about in order to be good citizens. And so the readings for today are just saying that we can update all of that with recent research, social science research, social science research, and we can integrate that, that tradition that was very important for preserving American democracy with, um, with, so we can integrate ancients and very contemporary research. So that is the video for today. Again, I, I didn't do it last night. I apologize if you don't get to it. If you have to work all day, that's my bad. And I look forward to seeing you. I hope you at least got, got the material read and that'll, um, that's probably enough. So I'll see you in class.